since everybody's still here uh, and nobody hurt my feelings. <laughs> well, good. So today, uh, we want to talk about hybrid analysis mapping, which is some research that we did. Um, uh, at, at Denver, some research we did in conjunction with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and uh, we'll talk about some of the benefits that came out of that research that we didn't, uh, that we actually didn't expect when we set out on it. Um, but we've put together some, what I think are some interesting ways to make development tools uh, do security better, and for security tools to be made better using some uh, some benefit from the development tools. Um, here we go. That's a picture of me, in case you were unsure of what I look like. I'm not entirely sure why that gets included every time, but that's fine. Uh, I'm Dan Cornell. I'm the CTO and founder of Denim Group, and my background is as a developer. I uh, started out initially doing a lot of uh, early server-side Java stuff. Um, you know, in the early 2000s, I did some uh, early ASP.NET stuff. But what I've really spent the last uh, you know, eight or so, eight or nine years of my career doing is looking at how developers and how folks developing software impact the security of their organizations. And so asking uh, how does development impact the security posture of an organization and how do you get developers to build more secure software on a more repeatable basis. And so that colors a lot of what I talk about or how I describe this, I think. Um, but again, I come at this from a development background um, coming into security. Um, again, been involved in OWASP for a long time. I help run the OWASP San Antonio chapter and uh, so on and so forth. And so uh, what I want to start out talking about is looking at what security teams typically want, um, you know, what, what their goals are, and to contrast that with what development teams want, and to look at the types of tools that each organization's, uh, each of those organizations tend to use. Uh, and that'll set the stage then to look, uh, we'll talk through this research that we did on what, uh, what we call hybrid analysis mapping, which is looking at how, you know, the initial research was looking to see if we have results from a static analysis tool, you know, code review tool, and if we have results from a dynamic tool, a web scanning tool, can we merge those together? Uh, you know, essentially a data management problem. Is there a way that I can take these two different data sources and stitch them together so that people don't have to do that manually? Uh, and then we'll look at, I'll talk through some of the internals of what we built and the outgrowth of that. Um, some additional tools that we were able to build based on that technology um, that, that are all available you know, for free, open source, downloaded from GitHub. Um, and we'll have you know, links and pointers to all that stuff. And uh, I'll go through some demonstrations of uh, you know, the tools that we built and how those can help solve certain problems that we see development teams facing, you know, as well as security teams facing. Um, and we'll have, uh, I think, some time for questions at the end, but this is a good sized group. If you have questions along the way, please feel free just to uh, you know, raise your hand or wave your hand at me and, uh, and, and stop me and I'll uh, address those. Any questions so far? <laughs> All right. Everybody's still committed to this talk and not going to the Open Sam talk? That's good. <laughs> We're even getting new folks. This is great. Uh, <clears throat> All right. And so, Again, just uh, career-wise, I've had the opportunity to work both on the development side as well as on the security side, and that's uh, given me the ability to see kind of how these different teams work. Um, and development and security teams certainly have different goals. Uh, they get rewarded, you know, they get compensated and rewarded in different ways, and, uh, and that leads to different behaviors. Um, and they also use very different tool sets, and that's one of the big challenges that I've seen as security organizations try to go and work with development teams. Um, you know, this is starting to change, but a lot of the more traditional security folks, the security practitioners, don't have a strong background in development. Again, at OWASP here, I think we see a lot of really good and healthy crossover, um, and we're seeing more of that in the industry, but if you look at the installed base, if you will, of uh, you know, developers and the security teams that are trying to work with them, um, there's not a tremendous uh, amount of crossover. Uh, in fact, it's uh, interesting talking at like ISSA events, uh, you know, you'll ask, hey, how many of you folks, uh, you know, how many folks uh, have a programming background, and, you know, lots of people raise their hand and you say, well, how many of you have a programming background that's not in Fortran or COBOL, right, and all the hands go down, <laughs> right, and so, uh, uh, yeah, so that's a challenge because you don't see a lot of, uh, you know, the, again, more traditional security folks that have a strong background in modern web development where they understand you know, Java, they understand .NET, they're used to building uh, you know, you know, modern web applications. Um, the, the challenge is, and, and this is one of the reasons why I think 
application or software security is so hard, but also why I think it's a really interesting area uh, in which to work is like these groups have to work together. You know, the, uh, the development team, if left to their own devices, is you know, probably not going to create software with an acceptable level of security that's going to manage or you know, control an organization's risk. Um, you know, but the security team doesn't have the ability to solve the problem themselves. Um, you know, and certainly not in the way that they, uh, you know, security teams typically have uh, much more control over their environment to handle more infrastructure or network issues. Um, and so these groups have to learn to work together. And the organizations that we've seen that have made the most progress for software security, these groups have learned to work together. And uh, one of the things that we found uh, you know, to be an indicator of success is the ability of the security team to start to get their minds wrapped around how developers work, which involves understanding how developers use different tools. From a development standpoint, you're right, when I was doing development, uh, and you know, our folks that do development, it's features, functions, timeline, right? I have X number of use cases or user stories, right? I have a certain number of team members, I have a certain amount of time, I have a budget for pizza and Jolt Cola. Um, which they apparently no longer sell. So Mountain Dew, whatever, whatever the kids drink these days. Uh, Red Bull, Monster Energy drink, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but you know, we, we, we've got these resources, we've got this stuff to get done, and uh, you know, we just need to finish it, right? <clears throat> and developers don't get rewarded for writing super secure code, typically, you know, much as they don't get rewarded for using every pattern in the Gang of Four design patterns book, right? Although for some reason developers are more than willing to take extra time to use all the design patterns in the Gang of Four pattern book, but are less interested in security, I don't know why. But uh, you know, developers don't get rewarded for writing pretty code, right? They don't get rewarded for writing fast code unless that's a critical business thing. They get rewarded for writing code that has a suitably like, low number of bugs um, and getting it done on time and you know, by whatever means necessary. And if you look at how developers manage their workload, you know, typically most development teams are using some sort of change management tool, often a bug tracking, you know, defect tracking system, right? <clears throat> you know, a lot of folks using Jira, Bugzilla, um, you know, bigger organizations, uh, you know, HP Quality Center, stuff like that. You know, that is where the to-do list for a lot of development teams live. That's how they get work. That's how they manage their workload. And if you look at where they spend the majority of their day, it's in their IDE, it's in their integrated development environment. Like that's their window to the world, that's where work gets done. And so there's challenges when you see security teams come around and say, you know, for security purposes, right, you're doing all your work over here in your defect tracking system, that's how you're tracking all your work. You know, but instead for security, which is a magical separate special thing, you need to do your work off of this, you know, 300 page PDF that I've printed out and put sticky notes on the stuff that I think is important, right, from the, from, from the scanner, <laughs> right? Or you need to log into this other system to manage your security workload as opposed to using your, uh, you know, your, your defect tracking system. <laughs> and so that creates friction, right, and in a lot of cases gives developers an excuse to say, I was going to fix security bugs, but it's too hard, right? Or, or it was easier for me to work on this other stuff as opposed to, uh, you know, as opposed to fixing these security bugs. Um, if you look at security groups, you know, it's, uh, you know, what's our policy, right? What are our standards that we use to try to meet that policy? You know, how are we managing risk? And the goal is to keep the world safe, right? Which is a much more uh, amorphous goal uh, than, than most development teams have. And what we've seen is a lot of network and infrastructure tools and paradigms are kind of getting crammed down on the development teams, right? And so, uh, you know, Folks say, well, for network security, we use network scanners, right? And that solved the network security problem. So why don't, if, we, if we've got a network scanner to find problems in networks, why don't we make an application scanner that's going to do the same thing for an application? Or, right, uh, or we used firewalls to solve the problem of hackers and keep them on the outside. In the network and infrastructure world, let's make an application firewall that's going to you know, perform a comparable function uh, over here. And so you know, I think we've seen a lot of the dubiously successful paradigms from network and infrastructure security applied in even more dubious and uh, less successful way in the application uh, in, in the application space. You know the problems with security tools. Um, you know if you're if you're a security person, again if you're coming into uh, or if, if you're coming into software security from a background as a you know sysadmin or network or infrastructure person, if you don't have a strong uh, you know so software development background, it can be really challenging to use static analysis tools, right? 
And uh, you know, certainly we challenge to use them, and it's you know, even more challenging to use the results that come out of those static analysis tools. Right? It's really tough to get a, a, a clean or a good static analysis run if you don't know how to run a software build. If you've never used Make or Ant or Maven and don't understand that process of how software dependencies get to put together and libraries get to put together, um, it's going to be really challenging for that person to you know, be successful running a static analysis tool and, and dealing with the results. Right? And, and that's another challenge in a lot of cases with static analysis tools is the plethora of results that you see coming out of them that you've got to be able to look and say, you know, okay, well, this is the important stuff, this is the stuff that I want to check next, and this is the stuff I'm going to get to when I have time. Uh, again, in the absence of a strong understanding of how applications are constructed, how applications get built, you know, and how the code works as uh, you know, traffic flows through it, it's really challenging to, um, you know, to be able to interpret those results successfully. Uh, dynamic scanning tools have their own challenges as well. You know, they've got to be properly configured to get good coverage. Uh, you know, and I tell this story all the time. We were working with a big uh, financial organization, and uh, you know, they said, hey, we ran <coughs> this you know, fancy commercial scanner on our application, a you know, big 500-page you know, Java-based web application, and we found no vulnerabilities. Right? Security is solved in our organization because we got a clean scan. Took a look at the scan results and said, well, you scanned the home page and the login page. <laughs> You did train it to log in, so it didn't. Uh, it didn't. It didn't actually check the other 498 pages in the application. And I suspect if we take a closer look at those, then there might be a couple problems that you, you need to be concerned with. You know, so don't break your arm patting yourself on the back just yet. We've we've still got more work to do. Um, and uh, you know, and that's a challenge with scanners. Even if you've got them successfully configured to log in, you know, scanners need to understand the application. They need to be able to properly spider the application to understand what the attack surface is, so that they can you know, fuzz and exercise that attack surface to get uh, good results back. The problems that we see with security tools, if you're a developer, is, you know, again, I mentioned this before, developers don't speak PDF. Right? If you go, uh, you know, and we see this pattern over and over again, security comes in, runs a scan, generates a 300-page PDF, the color graph on the front page, hands it to the development team and says, I did my job, it's your, you know, fix it, right? <laughs> Apparently you guys are bad at software because you know, we got a 300 page report and the graph's in color. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of red on the graph, which, you know, <laughs> and so you guys need to you know, you know, go for it. The, the, even worse, what we see is organizations where they run two different scanners, right? You know, hey, we went in and ran this scanner, we ran this scanner. Now we have two 300-page PDF reports with two color graphs on the front page, right? 600 total pages of results, and it's, well, hey, some of these are probably repeated, but we're not sure which ones, right? And the, the challenge there, that gives the development team every excuse in the world to push back and say, like, you are actively wasting my time, right? I'm going to go to my VP, who we've made promises to for important customers. I'm going to go to my VP, and, like, guess what? Security is no longer going to be a priority for this organization. And so that's a really big challenge. So, you know, developers don't speak PDF. Uh, for the security teams that have been nice enough to correlate all this stuff manually in an Excel spreadsheet, I'm sorry to let you know that despite, uh, they, they're probably selling a Rosetta Stone for it, but developers still don't speak Excel either, right? And so, uh, you know, trying to communicate with developers, you know, we found that to be universally ineffective. And in a lot of cases, taking action for developers on dynamic scan results can be challenging, right? If you say, well, hey, you've got a cross-site scripting vulnerability on, you know, if this URL for this parameter, you know, um, you know, in some environments, in like a kind of a, you know, basic you know, PHP or classic ASP environment, oh, okay, well, the name of the URL matches pretty well with the name of the file, right? And so that may be you know, relatively easy to track down unless you've got different things that are included or something like that. Right? But in modern web development frameworks, your like, login.jsp page might not be in login.jsp. It might be in com.whatever.whatever.whatever.login controller if you're using something like Spring. And so in a lot of cases, it can be challenging for developers to take action based on these dynamic scan results. Uh, and again, you know, looking across, so like taking a step back and looking at this, the developers have, you know, have a lot of stuff to get done. You know, they've got security fixes that you want them to get done and you know, features and other things that uh, you know, other people ask them to get done. From a security person, if you want to see them take action, you have to take excuses off of their plate. You have to reduce the friction in the process. Um, and in doing so, what, you, you know, what we've found in environments is that you start to get better activity from the developers. If you're working with them in the tools they're working in, if you're speaking their language, you know, you're taking friction out of the process and you're going to see developers start to make a lot more progress in, uh, you know, on security tasks. 
So how do we make this better? Well, you know, developers certainly need to know more about security. They need to learn more about security. You're not going to make every developer into an expert, but every developer should have some background, you know, authentication, authorization. Why do I do input validation? How do I do contextual encoding? You know, what are the libraries we use to, uh, you know, to, to conquer these different tasks? Um, and so, you know, that's certainly the case. But again, it's unrealistic, I think, for security teams to expect every developer to be an expert in things like this. You know, similarly, security teams need to learn more about development. Right, this like generating a scan, you're saying, well, I used to use you know Nessus to like, run scans against the network, and that gave me uh, you know this that I you know a PDF that I took around, you know, saying now I'm running an XYZ scanner that gives me a PDF. You know, that's not going to be you know, again, that's a message that's not received well by developers, and so security teams need to learn more about how development teams work, um, <clears throat> because you know again, you, what you want to be able to do is go and speak to the developers in their language, and that's going to get you better compliance. You're, you're going to be more effective in getting developers to take action if you can, uh, you know, if, if you can speak to them in la their language and work with them in the tools that they're using. Yeah, so what? Um, the genesis of this presentation was some research that we did with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Um, and we uh, basically, they had, a, or they had asked for solicitation. They said, here's areas that we want people to do research in. Um, you know, make a proposal and, uh, you know, and we'll you know, respond and possibly give you some funding. And what we, what we were looking to do is to better integrate not security and development tools, but to make security tools work better together. And most specifically, we wanted to make dynamic scanning tools and static scanning tools work better together. You know, we saw a lot of organizations where they were doing static analysis, they were doing dynamic analysis, you know, in a lot of cases with uh, you know, tools from different vendors. Um, and you know, the result was we've got this PDF and this PDF, and if I want the data to work together, I have to take all these results from static and all these results from dynamic and dump them into an Excel spreadsheet and spend like way too much time trying to stitch this stuff together. And so, you know, what we originally set out, like our phase one goal of this research was to determine if it was feasible to take the results of a Fortify scan and an app scan, scan, a dynamic scan, and stitch them together. And so, you know, from a dynamic security testing standpoint, you know, how do most of the dynamic scanners work? They, you know, first have to figure out, like, what is the attack surface of this application that I'm going to be looking at? So that I can then step, you know, move on to the next step, which is to fuzz that and look at the request and response patterns to determine if it looks like if I send this request and I get this response, that's indicative of a cross-site scripting vulnerability, or that's indicative of a SQL injection vulnerability. <coughs> Everybody here is familiar with dynamic scanning tools so far? Everybody? You know, similar in the you know, in the static scanning tools, you know they look at application source code or an application binary. Uh, you know, build some sort of data structure that represents how the application, uh, you know, how how the application is structured, how it's supposed to work, and you know, much like a compiler um, or virtual machine would, and then they perform some sort of a, you know different types of analysis in order to determine what um, you know if there are patterns that would be indicative of certain vulnerabilities or weaknesses. And so, you know, here we can see. Right, we get parameter returns, uh, you know, dirty or tainted data that goes in username. That username gets appended into this string, uh, you know, SQL, which is then also tainted. That gets fed to execute, and so that you know, by being able to draw a line between this tainted input and this sensitive sync function, the static analysis tool is able to say like, oh, okay, well, this is indicative. You know, this pattern is indicative of a SQL injection vulnerability. And so these are different types of analysis. One of them is looking at the software in, you know, at rest and you know, you know, applying pattern matching to the structure of the software to try and determine if there are issues. The other is exercising a running application with you know, no knowledge or little or no knowledge of how that application is structured. So it's a black box. I send this in, I get this out. So our goals for this research were to figure out you know, can we standardize vulnerability types across these you know, two different types of tools? You know, can we find a way to match the location right, of, you know, if I have a certain request and response pattern, can I determine in the software where, the, where that request hits and where that response comes from? You know, and can we figure out more about what the specific entry point to the software um, that is causing the problem, you know, can we identify those particular entry points? And so, uh, you know, drilling into this, um, you know, we basically needed to create some data structures in order to do this, uh, and create a model, and then run a, you know, run, run some tests to determine if this were possible. 
We built this on top of uh, an application that we, uh, an open source application we put together called ThreadFix. And what ThreadFix is, it's an open source platform for vul application vulnerability management that lets you basically load in the results of different static and dynamic testing, um, you know, both automated and manual, uh, normalize and deduplicate the results, and then manage those through the resolution process. Um, and I'll show some quick demos of that. <coughs> but this was a good base for what we were looking to do because we could already do dynamic to dynamic matching, right? You could load in the results of a W3F and a ZAP and an app scan, and the you know, and ThreadFix will take those in, normalize the data, and give you one uh, you know one single view into those vulnerabilities. You know, similarly, we could do it on the static side where you could load in the results of you know like a Fortify, uh, you know, an ounce or whatever. <clears throat> Again, it would uh, normalize and then dedupe that data, and so it made sense to include this technology on top of that so that we could take the static results and the dynamic results and stitch those together. Uh, stitch those together as well. Yeah, that's a picture. That's a list of the different uh, tools we can talk to. That's a slightly more fun page with pictures on it that basically says the same thing. Um, <clears throat> and, so, and so in doing this research, we had to figure out like, what do we consider to be a unique vulnerability? And in the dynamic, uh, for dynamic results, um, basically we, uh, we decided on the MITRE's CWE, their common weakness enumeration as the uh, you know, as, as our taxonomy for vulnerability types um, and for dynamic results what we found was for certain types of vulnerabilities you uh, you know just matching the CWE and the relative URL um, it was sufficient to indicate a unique vulnerability and so you know if you have a, a predictable resource location if you have like login.php.back on the server uh, that's indicating probably some bad configuration management you know this is easy to guess that this thing is here it's probably not supposed to be here uh, and if two different scanners find that CWE with that same URL uh, again probably the same issue same thing with like directory listings for misconfiguration other stuff like that if you're looking at injection flaws um, you know, things including like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, um, all of those uh, injection flaws, uh, then a unique vulnerability uh, according to our data structure is that CWE, you know, what type of vulnerability is it, what's the relative URL, but also what's the injection point. And so what's the name of the parameter that gets passed in that is being mishandled? Or what is the name of the, you know, the cookie or the header um, <clears throat> that, you're, that you're sending in? Uh, again, so normal, by taking the results of these different scanners and normalizing to that, we're able to take different scan results uh, on the dynamic side, load them in, and, uh, you know, and, and end up with a consolidated list of those vulnerabilities. Um, we picked the uh, MITRE CWE. There's, uh, like every vendor has their own uh, you know, taxonomy that they use for, um, keeping, you know, for, for describing how vulnerabilities are. Um, you know, we originally tried to create our own, which was... Uh, probably misguided, and ended up working with uh, settling on the CWE. Um, it's funny when talking to the MITRE guys, or you know, I like to say that the CWE is the worst vulnerability taxonomy out there, except for all the other ones. All right, it's like the democracy of uh, vulnerability taxonomies. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, so uh, CWE is exhaustive. It's a little sprawling at times, um, but it's a reasonably well-adopted standard. A lot of tools already had the mappings uh, that we needed there. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and so, again, we found it to be a pretty workable solution and certainly one that is better. It makes life a lot easier to use something like the CWE versus trying to maintain something like our, our own thing that we made up. Um, it also helps us integrate with, the, you know, again, as we, as we communicate this data or if we need to normalize across different organizations, um, it makes it easier to do that. So with our research, what we did is we passed in to, uh, to, the, to the technology, the engine we built, um, some amount of source code, um, you know, either via you know, being able to pull it from Git um, or from a local file path. Uh, Git usually works better because ThreadFix is a server-based application, so the, you know, it needs to be able to get to the software. Um, so like a relative file path from the server is a hard thing to set up via a browser. That's kind of a weird concept to set up. Uh, it's easier just to say, like, here's our Git repository, this is the branch that we're on, and here's the username and password, um, so they can get access to that. Um, we also uh, you know, pass in or automatically detect the framework type. Right now, the technologies we support for this hybrid analysis mapping um, and, the, and the associated tools uh, are Java-based. Java, JSP, and Java Spring applications are supported. Um, we're working right now on ASP.NET MVC, and we'll have uh, you know, Visual Studio and associated plugins coming out uh, soon. Um, and then, uh, you know, in this case, because we were looking specifically at matching Fortify and AppScan results, uh, you know, we went to see if we could pull some additional information from Fortify as well. So for the vulnerability type,
again, um, you know, we basically standardized everything back to the CWE. Uh, and we did some looking at um, software fault patterns. Um, I, I don't know for folks that are uh, you know, familiar with the MITRE CWE, they've got some uh, you know, associated vulnerabilities. We tried looking at matching across those. That wasn't really effective. <clears throat> but uh, again, so what we do is we map everything back to the CWE and we create a unified endpoint database. And so we do this lightweight static analysis of the application where we run over the source code, detect the framework type, and we build a database that where we basically calculate the attack surface of the application. And so we look across the code and take uh, you know, evidence from the code where we say <clears throat> this URL, like this application is going to expose the URL login.jsp. And the reason I know that this application is going to expose login.jsp and a username parameter is because I found a get parameter call in log, or the file login.jsp. Or because I found a call to, you know, in a spring situation, I found a reference to a model element in com.xyz.login controller, right? And so we build this database where we say, I think I'm going to have this piece of attack surface in the application. And that's based on this line of source code. So we go through the code, build this database, and then that lets, then we're in a situation where we can query that database and say, hey, you know, I've got something here on the attack surface. Tell me what source code is responsible for that. Or you can go the other way and say, for this piece of source code, where can I expect this code to be attached to the dynamic running application? And in doing that, that let us do the static to dynamic matching because we could basically say, well, I've got my dynamic scan results again that says I have a SQL injection vulnerability at login.jsp for the username parameter, right? <clears throat> On the static side, we could say I've got a SQL injection vulnerability and the source function is at com.xyz.login controller line 93. All right, when we run those against one another, we say, okay, well, I've got this SQL injection on the dynamic side on the attack surface matches up with the SQL injection in the code at this location. You know, these are probably representations of the same vulnerability. So this request goes into the code here and comes out there. And so we can do that and match and consolidate. So that led us, we were successful in doing what we wanted to do, which was to figure out like, can we um, you know, massage, can we manage this data such that we can link up static and dynamic results. Um, the cool thing that came out of that, uh, you know, so we're sitting in a meeting and we're talking about how this is laid out and figuring out like, okay, you know, we're getting X percentage of matching. And then the question was, well, wait a minute. If we just queried this database, right, and said essentially like a select star from this endpoint database that we had, won't that tell us the entire attack surface of the application, right, independent of whether or not there's a vulnerability at those, uh, you know, at those points in the attack surface. So even before we've done the dynamic analysis, since we have this model, can we build, you know, can we build an attack surface model of the application? The answer was, you know, sure, we can just, you know, write another function to pull that data out. <clears throat> and similarly, we asked, well, even if we haven't done the static analysis, if we have these dynamic results, can we determine what the line of source code that the developer needs to look at is? And the answer was yes. And so you know, coming out of that, what we figured is we can do some interesting things beyond what we originally looked to do. Um, just to talk a little bit about the technology under the hood, um, <clears throat> basically to parse the attack surface locations, you know, you know, in a JSP environment, we started through a JSP folder, um, you know, and, uh, and, and, and figure out the different files and files that get included. It's, it's you know, fairly straightforward. You've got to watch for some infinite recursion stuff and whatnot. But basically, you know, those are just files laid out. The structure of, or like the structure of the site from a dynamic URLs that are exposed uh, from that standpoint uh, matches pretty similarly to what the directory and file structure looks like. In a spring environment, this is more complicated. Um, but basically what we do is we go through and we parse all the at controller classes to determine all of the attack surface, um, all the URLs that get exposed and whether they're get or post, or whether they listen to gets or posts. And then we parse the model classes to determine what parameters can be passed in. Uh, similarly, in a JSP environment, we look for calls to get parameter right now, and we do some uh, some lightweight data flow analysis to see uh, you know to see what gets passed in there. <clears throat> and in Spring, we parse the request params, path variables, and at entity annotations. Um, and so, in doing this, we get this uh, bridge that we use again to do this static to dynamic mapping. And so. The question that we asked from this was, if I know the attack surface of an application, can I feed that back to a scanner 
to, you know, to kickstart the spidering process, right? And this goes back to uh, the, the story about like, you know, hey, I ran a scan and in my 500 page application, we scanned two pages, right? And so it's a question of, you know, can I, like if I know about the application's attack surface, can I seed the scanner with that information so that we get uh, you know, more thorough scanning? Um, and the answer is, you know, as long as the scanner has uh, you know, the ability to customize in that way, yes, you can, right? And so in calculating this attack surface model, we can feed that data to a scanner so that it knows what, um, you know, it knows all the URLs it should be able to get to. And so that spidering process that the scanner goes through where it says, okay, I'm gonna start with the home page. Let me find all the links on the home page, right? I'm gonna go to each of those pages and look for the links or forms that go off of there. Um, you know, again, the scanner is probably still going to want to do that process, but you can seed it and essentially say, you know, based on our model, here's every URL that this application should respond to and every, uh, you know, every parameter that you should be able to feed to this application and get some sort of behavior change from the application. <clears throat> and so using this data, again, we can make the scanners smarter so that they can, um, so that you can get better scan results or your starting point is not trying to guess what parts of the application are there, you already know, or the scanner already knows what application stuff should be responding, and so you can get a more thorough scan. Similarly, if we go the other way, even if you haven't done a full-blown security static analysis, if I've got dynamic analysis results and a model that takes the, um, you know, that takes each attack surface location and maps it to code, if I know that I have a SQL injection at a certain attack surface location, I can get the line of code responsible you know, not necessarily for the entire vulnerability, but I can get the entry point. And so what we figured is we can also go and make plugins for IDEs that take the results of a dynamic scan and map that back to the line of code. So in the static analysis world, all the static analysis tools have, uh, you know, have IDE plugins, at least most of them do, which, which is great, right? Because that's helpful for developers to say, right, I'm gonna tell you that there's a problem and I'm gonna show you exactly where that's at, right? Which is a nice thing to do for developers if you want them to take action. In the dynamic analysis world, uh, I, I don't know of anybody else that's doing that right now where they can say, here's a dynamic scan result, uh, and by the way, developer, here is where you need to go to start, uh, you know, to start trying to solve this problem. Um, <clears throat> so based on this, we saw opportunities both to make the security scanning tools more thorough, as well as to put better information in the hands of developers so that they can do remediation more quickly. The basic system setup, um, We've got the ThreadFix server that has access to the application source code. <coughs> you know, you know, we've got a, I'll show an example of working with the Zap scanner. And so you can pull, you, ThreadFix basically pulls the source code, builds the model, feeds it to the Zap scanner that it then uses to inform its scanning of the target application. Those results get fed back into ThreadFix and that data then with the uh, you know, lines of code and the vulnerability data, we can then send to an Eclipse IDE. <coughs> Um, so, um, any questions about this? I want to launch into some demos, but uh, I want to see if anybody had any questions about what we've done, or what we've talked about so far. Anybody? All right. Excellent. Do any yeah. scanners have support for to go to scan for attack surfaces? Um, right now, we've got plugins written for, um, for Zap and Burp, and we're uh, looking at adding support to AppScan next. Um, you know, and with the data that we have, um, and with the data that we have, like a lot of scanners will let you feed them like a file, like a, a flat file. And so we've got a command line client that'll show you that you could probably run the command line client, you know, fouille around with the results a little bit and get a file that you could upload to something. And so. Every scanner basically needs uh, other type of data. Mm -hmm. It's not a common uh, format. Like uh, yeah, it's not a common format, but, uh, but that's something we've seen some interest in, and I've had, I had a chance to, you know, talk to, I don't know if Simon's in here, um, uh, you know, Simon from Zap, uh, you know, talked to Farah from uh, Mabatuna. Um, I've, I've talked to a couple of the scanner vendors, and I think that there's interest in having uh, a standard data format for this. Um, I talked to the folks at MITRE. Um, I was, I was uh, talking to some folks at MITRE um, and some of their government clients uh, a couple weeks ago, and I think there's some strong interest there in that. Um, the OWASP uh, DEF project, or data exchange format project that uh, Tom Stage is, uh, is, is, is kind of picked up the ball and is, is working on lately. Um, so I think there's some interest in that. Um, there's not yet a standard, but the, um, the nice thing is if someone wants a standard, we have, you know, I mean, like basically this data gets fed, um, you know, in our environment, 
these uh, th thread fix just has a REST API that you, the scanner calls into and says, feed me the endpoints, and it feeds the endpoints via like a JSON response. And so if somebody wants a standard format, I have a reference implementation of something that works. Um, you know, that, that obviously if, if they're, um, you know, as, uh, as we build out the model and make it more elaborate, I think that's going to need to change. Um, but we've at least got something that we've demonstrate work for this type of a use case. Um, that we're, we're happy to change it to something else if, if somebody has a better idea, or in the absence of a better idea, we've got a thing that, that works right now. Uh, yeah? A very, very lightweight static source code analysis. And so it's not, and I'll show you, we've got a command line client, and I'll show you how quickly the command line client runs. It'll hopefully give you an idea of just how like, deep the analysis is. Um, but uh, we can also, you know, uh, like the, some of the static analysis tools package, like in their results package chunks of source code. We can also like take that source code and build a partial model based on that. Um, the matching works a lot better if you have access to the full source code. Um, this even compared to like a fine bugs, this runs much more quickly than that. It basically runs through uh, because like fine bugs uh, and PMD or even, or even or like or one case, and if you look at even a more significant case where you have like a full full blown like data flow analysis from like a commercial static analysis tool, it takes even longer. Um, this this static analysis basically just runs through the file, tokenizes it, and looks for very specific chunks of text. Um, and so it has the advantage of it runs very quickly and you don't need to do a lot of configuration. You just point it there and it figures out and does the best it can. The disadvantage is you're not going to get the type of deeper insight that you would get from a commercial static analysis tool or even like a fine bugs or something like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, like we run over a couple of 10,000 lines of code in a second or two. I mean, it's, it's the runtime has been negligible in anything we've fed to it so far for the depth of static analysis that we're doing, which again is, is, is pretty surface level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, let's run through real quick, um, just to give you an idea. Um, so the, the support that we have, the platform support for JSP is about uh, 698 lines of code, uh, of, of Java code. Uh, and the uh, you know, about just under 1500 for spring. And so it's not something that you could, uh, you know, it, it, it takes some time to go in and write the parser for the framework uh, to get this, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not ridiculous. And so we're right now working on uh, ASP.NET MVC, and uh, we've got a little bit of work done toward Python Django. Um, but it's certainly something, and we've talked to, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to a couple of people. Um, about uh, the JSR-168, the portlet things, and stuff like that. So I think there's some interest, and uh, if, if folks are interested in extending this stuff, you know, we're happy to support them in doing that. Uh, you Basically, you have to implement this endpoint generator interface that emits these, uh, those mashing pair of here's an endpoint and here's the source code responsible for it. Um, and so it's been designed in such a way that you know, if people have, if your organization has like a custom framework uh, that we see in a lot of places, you know, again, it's a little bit of a de development project to add in support, but as long as there's an algorithmic way that you can take source code and say, this source code is going to look like this when it hits the server, um, it's something that can be extended. Uh, okay, so just to run through. Uh, run through here. <coughs> Um, basically, so this is ThreadFix. You can log in. So this here, and what we see here is look at the, the different cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And so here, here we see a cross-site scripting vulnerability that was identified both by AppScan and by Fortify, um, where. To the dynamic scanner, it was in the relative path slash budget slash contact.jsp. Uh, in the source code, it was in root slash contact.jsp. We normalized that URL path, match the parameters, and then we can say, you know, these two scanners found this, and, uh, and we're able to roll this result up into one. Another interesting thing that we see, um, because we have a model of the application um, that we've built, 
we can further clean up some of the data that we see from these different scanners. And so here's an example. What you see in a lot of cases with dynamic scanners is they don't have an understanding of how the source code is structured. And so what you see with uh, applications that may have like a restful style of URL creation, you know, we'll have a vulnerability that's, you know, pet clinic owners slash five slash edit, owners slash six, owners slash seven, right? If a human looks at that, you say, well, that's not three different vulnerabilities. Like this is all mapping to the same code. The scanners don't know that, but because of the way that we build that attack surface model, the hybrid analysis mapping knows we've got slash owners, the next part is an ID, and then slash edit is the thing that comes after that. And we know, like the model knows that all that maps back to the same line of code, right? <clears throat> and so we're able to take these three vulnerabilities that were identified by app scan and basically make a pass over those and consolidate it. And so that's another way that this type of knowledge, like you know, if, if you take this knowledge of the application structure and pass the data from these scanners through it, what you end up with is a cleaned up data set so that instead of developers saying like, hey, you've got three problems that you need to go fix here, you're going to instead tell the developers, you've got one problem that you need to go fix here, and you need to go fix it at the code that is responsible for that piece of the attack surface. And again, from this, um, and we've got a, uh, this is just a simple, we uh, basically took the tech, uh, you know, and that's uh, totally impossible for anybody to read, I suspect. Uh, and that's not any better. Okay, so that was uh, basically we just ran the and bu built the attack service model for the Java Pet Clinic, um, which is a pretty small application. But again, if you look at the speed that that went through, it's not, you know, that's not process bound. Um, but see, what we see here is that we've been able to figure out that like this URL slash owners ID pets ID edit, um, you can either post or put to that URL. Oh, that's weird. Oops. And Below it are all the parameters that can be passed in based on the model. Also looking at this, when, when I look at this, when I look at a spring application, you know, we're parsing the model and looking at the auto binding configuration. And so I also look at this and say, you know, this auto binding is configured to allow pretty deep binding, which is not necessarily a best practice. And so as a manual pen tester or as a manual code reviewer, uh, you know, seeing that this is how, uh, you know, this is the parts, uh, or this is the type of auto binding to be done, makes me think that, uh, that there may be additional problems with that. Um, but basically this is just a command line tool that generates that attack surface model. And again, from a, from a processing power requirement standpoint, you know, that ran pretty quickly. Or we can go, all right. Oops. What did I do here? Hello? Huh. This is very bizarre. Of all the problems I've ever had with demos, losing control of the mouse is not something that I've ever had trouble. There we go. All right. And so here what we can see or what we can do is clear out our Zap session. Uh, but we've got a plugin that we've released for Zap that basically lets us go and import these endpoints. So we connect to the ThreadFix server. We tell it the application we want to pull the data for. I give it the base URL. And it pulls in those endpoints. <clears throat> and so what we see here is um, what we see here is that we've found pages that we would not have otherwise found, like this admin page, this admin.jsp page. Um, if you crawl the application, you're not going to find that. There's no links to admin.jsp in the application, but the application exposes that page. Uh, similarly, if you look at a number of these debug parameters, um, you'll, if you crawl the application, you're never going to find a reference to those debug parameters, right? Because it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's a you know, debug functionality. It's not supposed to be there. Um, but if you pass in that debug parameter, the application is going to do something based on it. I once did some work on a cold fusion application where any page in the application, if you pass in a parameter named D, 
it would take the value of that parameter and try to delete the order with that number. So if you passed in D equals 1,000, it would try to delete order 1,000. Right? Like, I, I don't know why the application did that. <laughs> you know, I think it was like a convenience feature, right? Uh, you know, some sort of administrative convenience feature um, that had somehow gotten cut and pasted into every page in the application. Um, but again, this, is the, this will help to identify situations like that so that you're exposing those parts of the application to, you know, to fuzzing. And again, what we're going to get here is a much more thorough scan of the application um, because we're getting all the URLs. And so if you have landing pages in your application that uh, you know, maybe link back into the application but nothing links back out to them, again, if you have this hidden debug uh, functionality, um, you know, if you've got auto binding turned on, um, you know, this is going to let the application scanner know here are additional pages you need to look at and here are additional parameters that you need to fuzz if you want to get thorough testing of, uh, of, of, of everything there. Uh, and, yeah, <laughs> that's the icon I need. There we go. <laughs> and uh, similarly, what we can do is connect to ThreadFix and pull data about the, uh, about the endpoints. <clears throat> and even with just a dynamic scan, we map back to lines of code. And so we can put these markers, uh, we can put these markers in the line of code. Uh, you know, again, with, a, with the full static analysis results, you're going to get better, um, you know, you're going to have a better user experience if you can show the entire data flow and control flow. You know, but at the very least, with the dynamic scan results sitting on top of this hybrid analysis mapping model, um, that lets you map back to individual lines in the IDE, which gives the development team a head start. <clears throat> And so the idea here is, you know, how do we give, how do we put developers in the best position possible to fix, uh, you know, to fix these different vulnerabilities? Okay. Um, any questions about those uh, those integrations? Uh, and so right now we support on the uh, on the scanner side we support burp and zap uh, with uh, with plugins and on the IDE side we support Eclipse and IntelliJ. Um, we're working on support for ASP.NET MVC and out of that we'll also be building a Visual Studio um, you know, plugin as well. Um, you know, and again, just looking at the relative level of effort to construct those uh, you know the parsers for the different frameworks. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that takes a couple of days, uh, you know, to kind of get something first working and then you've, you know, refined that with, uh, you know, additional testing data from there. Um, so what's next? We, uh, we actually started a phase two uh, with the Homeland Security folks, um, which, is, uh, which is great. So that's allowing us to add support for additional frameworks like ASP.NET. Um, uh, you know, we're looking, uh, we've done a little bit of work with Python Django. We're looking to add, you know, Struts, JSF, or Ruby on Rails and uh, working on Visual Studio. Uh, another thing that we're doing that I think is, uh, is, is pretty exciting is we're going to expand the model, uh, the attack surface model that we're building. Um, and we're going to add concepts of authentication, you know, which pages do you have to be authenticated for versus not. We're going to add the concepts of authorization, you know, for these pages you need to be in this role. Um, and we're going to also build out additional injection points. Right now we're only considering get and post parameters as well as path parameters uh, in REST style uh, URLs. Um, we're going to be adding uh, cookies and other HTTP header injection as well. And what I think that's going to let us do some really interesting stuff where based on that model, if you have a static scan result that says, you know, I found a thousand cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in your application, if you also have a filter where you, that you can apply to say, but these URLs are the ones that you can get to when you're, when you're unauthenticated. You know, that allows you to start to triage data more quickly by saying, I've got a thousand results that I'm worried about, or I've got a thousand results, but only 100 of them can be accessed from an unauthenticated user. Therefore, I'm going to focus on remediating these 100 first because you know, these are the ones that I consider to be higher risk. And so, uh, again, I think there's some, some pretty cool analysis that you can start to do if you've got a structured model for what an application looks like. You know, what's the attack surface? What are the injection points? Which portions require authentication or certain types of authorization? Um, because from that, you can start to make decisions. Um, and that's, uh, you know, again, a big push uh, that we've seen in a lot of organizations that try to scale is, you know, how do we, how do we get, um, you know, how can we better manage this giant volume of data that we've got? I think I'm just about out of time here. Um, but uh, again, this is stuff you can download from GitHub. Um, 
And uh, feel free to reach out to me if you've got any questions. If you uh, or you know want to add support for something, let me know. And uh, I don't. Do we have time for questions now? Or are we done? Uh, done. So I will be around outside. If you have any questions, please feel free to track me down. Thank you all very much.